resurrection. You know, Easter time, we, we sometimes focus on that day. We, we, the day comes and we get so excited and, and we forget that what Jesus accomplished for us with his death and his resurrection and, and what is ours because of that is ours not just on Easter, but on every day of the Christian's life. We welcome also those who might be joining us by means of Facebook here today. We'd love to have you let us know that you've joined us, so please like us or leave us a comment there on Facebook. And we'll be following the order of service that is printed in the service bulletin. Also, um, it will be projected in front of you here on the wall if you'd like to follow along that way as well. We'll begin our worship service here with the singing of our first hymn, hymn 752. And our service theme and thought really revolves around this truth that because those who wrote Scripture, wrote the Bible, were witnesses of these events, we can be sure that our faith is resting on something sure and certain, 
and Jesus does not demand a blind faith from us. So we begin with that singing of the first hymn, hymn 752. You'll find it in the blue hymnal that is underneath your seat. God's richest blessings to you on your worship. as it's projected in front of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. 
Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O risen Lord, you came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by your word and sacrament and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 5, as we read a select portion of verses from that chapter. And here we see that Christ's disciples served as witnesses. And remember what a witness is. Somebody who has seen what they're talking about. We read, Many signs and wonders were done among the people through the hands of the apostles. With one mind, they all continued meeting in Solomon's colonnade. The high priest rose up along with his associates, that is, the party of the Sadducees, because they were filled with envy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison, brought them out, and said, Go, stand in the temple and keep on telling the people the whole message about this life. After they heard this, they entered the temple courts at daybreak and began to teach. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, that is, the whole council of elders of the people of Israel. Then they sent orders to the jail to have the apostles brought in. But when the officers arrived, they did not find them in the prison. They returned and reported, 
We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. And the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words. They were puzzled about them, wondering what could have happened. Then someone came and reported to them, Look, the men you put in prison are standing in the temple courts and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought the apostles in without force because they were afraid that the people might stone them. After they brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin. The high priest asked them, Did we not give you strict orders not to teach in this name? Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood down on us. But Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you arrested and killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his right hand as prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of our God. At this time, our choir will sing their anthem. Our second lesson comes to us from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, reading verses 4 through 18. And in these words, we hear our Savior promise his people, promise the churches, that he will be with them as they continue to share the light of the gospel, even in the midst of persecution. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, 
Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is coming, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his own blood, and made us a kingdom and priest to God his Father, to him be the glory and the power forever. Amen. Look. He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. And all the nations of the earth will mourn because of him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingship and patient endurance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony about Jesus. I was in spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me, like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see on a scroll and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like a son of man. He was clothed with a robe that reached to his feet, and around his chest he wore a gold sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool or like snow. His eyes were like blazing flames, his feet were like polished bronze being refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. He held seven stars in his right hand. A sharp, two-edged sword was coming out of his mouth. His face was shining as the sun shines in all its brightness. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. I also hold the keys of death and hell. This is the word of our God. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel from John, chapter 20. These words will serve as the basis for our sermon this morning. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But Thomas, one of the twelve, the one called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger into the mark of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. 
But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess the Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the singing of hymn 165, which we find in the red hymnal underneath your seats, and we'll sing verses 1 and then verses 4 through 8.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from your risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know about you, but I like history. And so, when a conversation about what it must have been like for prisoners of war during the Civil War, when that conversation came up in my life this past week, I was intrigued. So I did a little bit of digging. And as I did, I came across and found out that there was a letter written by a Union soldier. In fact, this Union soldier was a commanding officer of a Confederate prisoner of war hospital in Maryland, and that this letter had been preserved over all of those years. This morning, I wanted to share a portion of it with you. Please, please permit me to do so. He wrote this to his family. War is cruel in all its parts. Our war is no exception to the rule, and yet our prisoners are treated with all reasonable tenderness and care. My experience and observation lead me to state, as the conclusion of my best judgment, that our prisoners of war at this point are as well fed and the wear and tear on their vital powers is as bearable as is the average with our own soldiers in active campaign. I thought I would look into the matter of our prisoners' conditions. Accordingly, I said to myself, in hospitals one sees misery, and so to the hospitals I will go. I must confess, having done so, to a strong sense, when I got through, of pleasure and pride in the Christian spirit and forbearance of our government. There was neither want nor misery there. I went through ward after ward. The wards were scrupulously clean. The ward masters and attendants were themselves prisoners, and in answer to my inquiries, all told me that they were very comfortable and had everything which could be expected. Evidently, there was no misery or suffering there. I confess, what I saw greatly surprised me. We could hardly take more tender care of our own sick soldiers. It's, it's nice to hear, isn't it, that they took such good care of those prisoners of war? And it's nice to hear it from somebody who was there, isn't it? It gives their report trustworthiness. It makes it reliable. After all, he was an eyewitness. Eyewitnesses. That's what we have in our gospel account here this morning from the Gospel of John. Thomas and those other apostles were eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. That means that their report is trustworthy and reliable. And it means that when Jesus invites us to put all of our trust in him, he is not demanding blind faith. And you know, that makes the world of difference for us. Now, the risen Christ on Easter Day had appeared to Mary Magdalene, to those other women, to Peter, and even to those Emmaus disciples. And reports of the empty tomb of the angels and of these appearances were being spread abroad, and this news was being discussed as those disciples and others gathered in that room that evening. But, but did you notice where they were? They were behind locked doors. It was to these frightened, these skeptical, these doubting disciples that Jesus appears. And you know, when you stop and you think about it, we could really say that this was an unscheduled appearance. And what I mean by that is that before Jesus' death, he had told his disciples that he would meet them in Galilee after his resurrection. 
That's 80 miles to the north of Jerusalem. And then the angels repeated that directive Easter morning, and Jesus himself repeated it to those women who came to the tomb that morning. Kind of like that person, you know, who, who's so excited to give a present to someone that they don't wrap it. Jesus was so excited to see his disciples. You see, he, he wanted to calm their fears. He wanted to remove all their doubts. He wanted to make it sure, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that he had risen and that they would know that. And so, he comes. But there was one apostle who wasn't there to see him. Thomas. And it's not hard to imagine what that next week must have been like for the rest of the disciples. Every single day, they would have been talking to Thomas. Thomas, it's true. It's true. We've seen him. We were there behind those locked doors, and, and he was there. He showed us his hands and, and his feet. And yet Thomas said, I, I, I just can't believe it. I'll only believe it if I see it. In fact, I need to touch him. Five-year-old had been missing since the night before. The other day, the mother had looked out the window in the afternoon to check on her son, but he wasn't where he was supposed to be. And what had happened? Did he wander away? Was it something even worse? And so mother and father and the police, the neighbors, <clears throat> they, they started searching all around. The night had been horrible and terrible. But finally, at 10.30 the next morning, a neighbor found the young boy in the woods next door, cold, hungry, crying, scared, but unharmed. He had wandered off and fallen asleep, and the, the leaves had hidden him. And when mom and dad saw him, they ran to him and hugged him. They didn't want to let go. Being able to touch him meant everything. Touching him assured them that he was really there. This son that they really loved was really there. Following Sunday, after Easter, Jesus came and stood amongst those disciples again. This time, Thomas was there. And then, in a supreme act of love, Jesus met the conditions that Thomas set, even though Thomas didn't have the right to set them. Thomas, touch my hands. He invited him to do the very thing he wanted. But why? Why did Jesus stoop to meeting Thomas' demands? Oh, to, to be sure, it was for his sake and for the sake of the rest of those apostles. He wanted them to be sure that he was really there, that he truly was alive. But if we see this event as only to be beneficial for Thomas and those apostles, we miss the bigger picture. You see, this is intended for us, too. Because after all, there are times, aren't there, that we are skeptics and we are doubters as well. There are those times that we sinfully place our own intellect or our own tainted, sinful human reason above everything else, and so we say, I'll only believe it if I see it. In fact, I need to touch him. But you see, every single one of Jesus' appearances, especially this one, is meant to drive away all of those doubts and all of that skepticism. For you see, these disciples, they were not fools and they were not stupid. They were not uneducated, naive individuals who were easily duped because they were some sort of hillbilly. 
They did not invent some sort of resurrection that they wished would have happened, but in reality didn't. In fact, it's just the opposite. These men were skeptics. They were doubters. One of them even said, I'll only believe it if I see it. And so Jesus, in grace and mercy, gave them what they wanted. Stood in front of them so they could see him with their very own eyes. He invited them to touch him. And through these disciples, we too see our risen Savior. Through these eyewitnesses, we too touch our risen Savior. That's why Jesus wanted them to touch him. That's why he invited them to touch him. That's why he wanted to stand there. That's why he met all of their conditions. He wanted not only to assure them that he had risen and it was really him and he was truly there, but he also wanted to assure us through their testimony that this is all true. That's why we can say beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus does not demand blind faith. Dear friends, that truth unlocks everything. It brings everything into crystal clear focus. Jesus is exactly who he says he is. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. He is true God, and everything he says is true. And that's really important, especially when it comes to understanding ourselves. Because you see, Jesus is the one who said this. Flesh gives birth to flesh. And what he meant when he said that is this. That when Adam and Eve chose to sin in the Garden of Eden, they brought sin and guilt upon themselves along with the consequences of death. And as a result, all of their descendants who have been born in the natural way have been born in this sinful condition, and that includes you and that includes me. And this sinful condition so thoroughly corrupts us that it places us underneath God's judgments. It makes us enemies of God and leads us to sins of thought and word and deed and separates us from our holy God. And that's a problem because Jesus has also said, be perfect, therefore, as my heavenly Father is perfect. But Because of our sinful nature, that's an impossibility. But that's not an excuse. No matter how we try to justify what we do, we cannot flatter God into ignoring the facts. No matter what we say, we cannot get him to ignore our sins. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves righteous. Our best is not good enough. We can't try to compare ourselves to others. And we know it's true because Jesus says so. And he has risen from the grave. And you know, when we rightly see our sin in the light of God's holy law, we see just how serious and deadly they are. We see how hopeless and powerless sin makes us. We see that we have made ourselves fit for nothing but God's wrath and hell. Like those disciples, we too are filled with fear. But you see, is to people just like you and me, trembling behind the locked doors of our horrid sin and doubts, that Jesus comes and says, Peace be with you. And because he has risen from the grave, we know that it's true. For just look how he shows those nail marks and hands and feet to his disciples and to us, and shows that wound in his side. It's really Jesus. He really is alive. And let that sink in for just a moment. The wounds of Jesus are gruesome. They're painful. His wounds are the marks 
of the wrath of God against sin and unbelief, against our sin and unbelief. That's what he shows us. But dear friends, by those wounds, our sin have been paid for. By those wounds, our guilt is covered. By those wounds, our death is defeated. By those wounds, heaven has been opened. By those wounds, God becomes a dear father, not an angry judge for all those who trust in Jesus with repentant faith. Ah, but, but, pastor, you might say, there's so many things in this world that still cause me to doubt. Look at all the troubles that come into my life. Look at all the evil in this world. How could God ever let that happen? Remember, when we see a living, risen Savior standing in front of us, we know that everything that he says is true. And what are some of those things that he has said? He has said, there are going to be troubles in this life because of sin. But he also tells us, those troubles have a beneficial purpose. To lead us to repent and to rely and trust on him even more. He says that those troubles, they are not evidence of my absence, but rather a reminder that you are not to love this world or the things of this world. Rather, set your mind on things above. And then he tells us, he promises us, and remember, I've overcome this world. So whatever your doubts, place them into the hands of Jesus. For, you see, there is no problem, no trouble, no doubt so heavy that he can't handle it. I mean, after all, he's already handled our death, hasn't he? There is no situation so prickly that he doesn't want to touch it. He's already handled our sin, hasn't he? Look at the nail marks. Touch your risen Savior. Believe that his wounds are for you. Those wounds paid the guilt of your sin. The blood that flowed from his side has covered over all of our guilty stains. That's what's most important. That's the answer in the midst of trials. You are fully and freely forgiven. What he says is true. Through faith in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God and an heir of heaven. There was a, a boy who didn't like the way that his mother looked. And this is more than just the teenage boy and him being ashamed or embarrassed of his mother. This was a unique situation, for you see, his mother had some very serious, noticeable, and bad scars on the side of her face and her neck. And it was starting to get to the point of where the, the son didn't really want to be around his mother at all. And it was becoming very apparent that both mother and child weren't, weren't getting along very well. And one day, the boy said to his mom, you don't need to pick me up from school anymore. So she finally figured, maybe it's time for me to tell him how I got these scars. So she said, One day, son, when you were just an infant, I woke up in the middle of the night in our apartment and it was on fire. There was no one around to help. So I ran through the fire to your room and took you out of the crib. I wrapped you up and ran through the fire again. You were perfectly fine. I survived, but I got burned quite badly on my right side. That's where these scars come from. From that moment on, the boy was never ashamed of his mother again. In fact, every single time that he looked at her, he was reminded just how much she loved him. friends, because we can, through the eyes of faith, 
see Jesus alive through the account of the eyewitnesses. There is no doubt about how much God loves us. Because we can, through the hands of faith, touch the scars of Jesus through these reliable records that have been recorded for us, we never have to wonder if Jesus cares for us. We know with certainty that whoever believes in him is not condemned. We never have to wonder if our sins are forgiven. We know beyond the shadow of a doubt that in all things he works for the good of those who love him. We know with absolute certainty that although we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he has made us alive through faith in Jesus Christ. And dear friends, that is not blind faith. That's real, saving faith. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for prayer. O precious Savior Jesus Christ, there is no work or sacrifice we can do to turn away God's wrath from us. But eternal thanks be to you, because through your suffering and death on the cross, you have won full pardon for our sins and established peace with God in our behalf. This peace God announced unmistakably to the whole world when he raised you from the dead. Now peace and forgiveness is ours. O oh, ever-living Lord, this peace which you brought to us sinners fills our souls with a holy joy, for we know that whenever we meet God, we shall stand before him unaccused, uncondemned, and unpunished, and that at the last we will be received into the everlasting joys of heaven. Let this Easter and resurrection joy be ours now and forever. And, O oh Lord, we now come before you with all of our wants and our other desires as we come to you in the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our next hymn, hymn 150. stand. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our final hymn.
A father and son were driving down the road one beautiful summer day with the windows half down when a bumblebee flew into the car. The child in the back, severely allergic to bee stings, started crying out, Dad, Dad, there's a bee, there's a bee, there's a bee. As it buzzed around, Dad calmly reached out and grabbed the bee in his hand. He held it there for a few moments and then opened his hand. The bee started buzzing around once again, and the child started frantically saying, Dad, Dad, the bee, the bee. He turned around to his son and said, Son, it's okay. As he opened his hand and showed his hand where the stinger from the bee was. He's already stung me, son. He can harm you, none. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He took the sting of sin, the sting of death, the sting of Satan's accusations, the sting of the Father's wrath, all for us. In Holy Scripture, through eye and ear witnesses, he shows us the nail marks on hand and feet. But all those who trust and know Jesus Christ as their Savior, the sting of all those things is gone. That's the joy of Easter. Once again, wonderful to meet with you, with you here this Sunday, and that very special welcome to all of you who are visiting with us here today as well. We'd love to have you visitors to, to take a moment and sign our friendship register that you find on the square table in the gathering area. We also invite you and welcome you to stick around for some, some coffee, some cookies, and some fellowship. And if you have time and are able, we'd also love you to have you stick around for Bible class, which is afterwards from 9.15 to 10.15. And we also have Sunday school for, for our children. Um, they break off into different different classrooms to learn a, a Bible story lesson. So we'd love to have those children stick around as, as well. Um, just a couple of announcements to draw your attention to here real quickly, and that is, please note, we will have our congregational voters meeting today. That'll be at 11 o'clock at our Cataract campus. Um, our next Worship at the Cross, which is a, a worship service um, designed for those with developmental disabilities, that's going to be this coming Saturday on the 30th of April. We also have a snack and a craft at that time. And then also take note that if you would like to have a faith t-shirt, there's a sign-up sheet on the um, white table in the gathering area, and you can sign up, and that t-shirt will be, will be provided for you. Um, maybe one final thing that I, I remembered here is that um, there, are, there is information for the congregational voters meeting if you wanted to see it ahead of time sitting on that white table as well. And then before we go and are ushered out this morning, we will watch April's edition of our Wells Connection. God's richest blessings to all of you, and God be with you till we meet again. President Mark Schrader. Risen Savior started as a home mission church in Lakewood Ranch, Florida, recently became a self-supporting congregation. In August of 2020, they opened a preschool. In addition to teaching children about Jesus, the congregation has been active, connecting and building bridges to parents. It's Harvest Festival at Risen Savior a fun, festive family event for the children who attend the church's preschool. But there's something else going on here. Members of the congregation, even those without small children, are here too. They're connecting with parents, creating an inviting atmosphere, and building relationships. We've invited our congregational members to come and just to be a part of the school and to get to know the, the children and the families and, and trying to merge those two into, into one family. Little ones to him belong, 
Building that connection between the classroom and the church has been a special focus for Risen Savior's preschool director, Maria Hines, and the entire congregation. God called me. He just placed in my heart a special place for these young children. Doing the early childhood ministry, it's not just about the children, but we are ministering to our parents that are coming in, and the way to do that, building those relationships with them. The growing Lakewood Ranch area attracts young families with children. Seeing this growth, Risen Savior realized a children's ministry could help them connect more families to the gospel message. And as we got to know our community, we saw there is a big need for Christian education, and, and especially at the preschool level. And God has been richly blessing it the last year and a half um, with a lot of families who are coming and giving us a lot of opportunities to share Christ with them. Case in point is the Davis family, who are new to the area, without a church home, looking for quality education. They enrolled their son, Billy. How great it was for Billy, really. Um, yeah. In those first few weeks, even he would come home and talk about God and talk and, about- And sing his cute little know, songs, it was so cute. And those kinds of things, which kind of brought us back to maybe, you know, that we should be a little bit more involved and get him growing up in a uh, church community. The preschool has grown from 20 students to over 70, with a waiting list. Families like the Davises are part of that growth. In addition, Risen Savior is working to daughter a mission church in Parish. Certainly, these blessings are from the Lord and demonstrate how he is working through many church members. The goal is a warm, welcoming environment where someone walks into our congregations or our schools and feels connected right from the get-go, that there are people there that care about them. Our Synod has developed a program to help congregations everywhere build that bridge from children's ministries and schools to church membership. It's called Telling the Next Generation. The purpose of Telling the Next Generation is help a congregation have a plan. When they come, how do we connect with them? How do we build relationships? And then how do we connect them with Jesus? Our quality schools bring people to our doors, but the next step, church membership, doesn't happen automatically. It requires an intentional effort by all of us to reach out to school families as we reflect an atmosphere of Christian love. As you've seen, the blessings at Risen Savior have led to efforts to plant a new home mission church 20 minutes north in Parrish, Florida, just east of Tampa Bay. We pray the Lord blesses this new mission to connect with many more families, young and old, so more souls can hear about Jesus Christ. Learn more and stay updated on progress at wells.net forward slash home missions.